Welcome to Role Playing History, the podcast where we explore the history of role playing games. I'm Wayne Davis, and I'll be your guide for today's tour. Episode 70 Harn Master and the Harn Setting. Like we announced last week, this week's subject came from our listener, Devlin Donnelly, who's made several suggestions for topics we've either covered already or will be covering in the near future. If any of us at Bad GM Productions were actually getting paid for this, we'd have to consider putting Devlin on the payroll. Since we're not, we'll all have to settle for Devlin being an honorary member of the Bad GM Production team. So, welcome to the family, Devlin. So, when he suggested this, he asked why we hadn't covered these games yet, and the answer is a simple one. Until Devlin sent me these names, I'd never heard of them. Now, that being said, I'm now very interested in getting my hands on them and giving them a whirl. If I do, you can rest assured we'll be breaking them down in great detail on Bad GM's campaign build-along. Now, before we get going today, I did want to note I've added two more subjects to today's show, Columbia Games and Kalesia Productions. And I did that because they're both responsible for product in the Harn universe, and the story with these two companies is very interesting. So you're going to be getting the full background on the game and the setting today, which come on now, you've come to expect that from me, right? All right. So enough of patting myself on the back. Let's crank up the tour bus and get this show moving. First up, let's take a look at Harn. Wait, wait, we're checking out the setting before the game? That we are. Just stick with me on this. The world of Harn first appeared in the release Harn, which came out in 1983. Columbia Games was the publisher, and Harn was created as a campaign setting for any fantasy role-playing game. For the record, the land of Harn was about the size of Great Britain at creation, and the 1983 release came as a full campaign folio, including the background history, religion, a small encyclopedia called the Harn Dex, and a map of Harn drawn by Harn's creator, N. Robin Crosby. In short, Harn was based on Norman England with fantasy elements thrown in. But rather than speak in generics, let's get specific. Harn is an island off the western coast of the region of Venerev, which is the northwestern part of the continent of Lithia, and all of this is on the planet Kathira. All of that being said, Harn tends to be the focus of the setting and the supplements. Therefore, most players refer to the world itself as Harn or Harn World. Now, there are some very notable things about Harn I wanted to make sure got pointed out here. Harn doesn't really have good versus evil. Things tend to be varying shades of gray if there's conflict. Now, as most gamers know, this makes Harn different from most other fantasy role-playing games. Harn also has a very high level of internal consistency and detail. That means there are a large number of individual cities, fortifications, towns, manors, and adventure locations. The specific details on these get all the way down to the peasant families living there and or the amount and types of garbage found in some places. In the minds of its fans, this level of detail is greater than any in any other fantasy role-playing game. Harn is also noted for a very high level of realism, which also means a very low, if any, amount of magic. That comes from the fact that Harn is based on Norman Britain. However, it is a fantasy game, so elves, dwarves, orcs, wizards, and the like do exist. It's just a situation where there isn't magic everywhere, and the details of Harn can be compared to actual events and locations in Norman Britain in a great many cases. Harn has a very detailed written history and events, and it's current to midnight on the first day of the year 720, and there's no intention on any of the main creator's part of advancing the official timeline. What that means is that any history or events that take place after that date are the purview of the individual GM, which means that all Harn games are unique, though they all have a common start point. Looking at Harn itself, there are nine kingdoms represented. Azadmir is the homeland of the Kuzan, which are the dwarves in Harn. Chibisya, which is a human kingdom, is actually an independent monarchy. It's depicted as struggling by some, and as a breakaway country of Kaldor by others. Evale is the elven kingdom, located on the southern coast. This is where the Sinai, which are what elves are called in the game, live. It's heavily forested, and the Sinai are very reclusive. Kaldor, this is human controlled with a very weak king. It's feudal in nature. It also has the advantage of being located at the hub of four trade routes, which makes it the power in the east. Also, it's probably the most detailed of all the kingdoms in the Harn releases. Kande, also human-controlled. It's on the western part of the island and is a very chivalric kingdom. 
Oh, and so I don't have to keep saying it, the rest of these kingdoms are human controlled, just for the record. Meldorin is located on the southeastern part of the island. It's also the most ancient of the kingdoms. Rumor has it it was founded by wizards, though there's not much proof to support these statements. It also has a monopoly on trade with the Lithian continent. Orbal, it's in the north, technically the furthest north on the island. It used to be a collection of peaceful princedoms run by the Jaren, which are the analogs of the British Celts. However, they were invaded and conquered by the Evinians, Harnish Vikings. So the Jaren are suppressed brutally and rebellion is building. Rethem. These folks have enemies all around them, mostly because it was a kingdom carved out through war and conquest. If there is evil in Harn, Rethem would be it. They have a philosophy of might makes right. Or it might be because the church of the death god Morgoth used the largest town in this kingdom as the base for their crusade. Well, that, that might have something to do with it. Tharda. It's the only state on the island that isn't a monarchy. Think of it as the equivalent of Republican Rome. It formed from the ruins of the Korani Empire, and while it's a republic, corruption and patronage are strong here, along with territorial ambition. So, how long the republic lives is kind of up in the air. Oh, and I should apologize because I'm positive I didn't get all those pronunciations correct. I did the best I could, so sorry. Now, I should note that while we've given the races the control of various kingdoms, there are over a dozen human barbarian tribes, as well as bands of orcs called Gargoon in Harn just wandering about. The planet Kathira is noted for being one of seven linked parallel worlds. They're known as Celestia. The other worlds have been described and or detailed in some works, so we will mention them here. Terra is the Earth analog. Yashane is a high magic world and is considered to be the afterlife for Katheria. Midgard, yeah, based on Tolkien's Middle Earth, enough said. The Blessed Realm, again, based on Tolkien. For the record, it's believed that the elves and dwarves left Midgard for Katheria. However, the elves only see Katheria as a temporary situation, as they're thinking the Blessed Realm will be their ultimate goal. While most of the materials released have covered the island of Harn, there have been products covering the nearby regions of Shorkine, which is a large feudal kingdom with a weak king, and Avinia, which is a Scandinavian analog replete with fjords, Vikings, and an old Norse-type region. The island of Chelembi has also been detailed in some products. Chelembi is a trading state and is an analog of the medieval state of Visby, which was Scandinavian for the record. A recent release covered the region of Venerev, which would be the analog of Europe, including the Mediterranean and Middle East. So this release allows for a game run outside of Harn proper, if that's something that might interest you. Now, pretty much every review I've found about the setting is positive. I'm going to pick one to use here. Roger Moore reviewed the setting in the September 1983 edition of Dragon. He liked it. He said about the map, quote, it's beautiful. If you are a fan of fantasy cartography, this map makes a wonderful addition to one's collection, having lots of legible detail and a well-worked-out ecological system and geography, end quote. He also had a lot of nice things to say about the Harn decks. Overall, he recommended Harn, though his recommendation was to, quote, experienced referees who don't mind using a largely prefabricated universe with a few minor alterations to suit their own campaign tastes. State of the art, it could be better, but it is very good. End quote. So we've looked at the setting of Harn. Now we look at the game system Harn Master. With the success of the Harn campaign setting, Columbia Games decided to move forward with an actual game. It was also written by N. Robin Crosby and was released as Harn Master in 1986. Now, there had been a number of Harn supplements released prior to the release of the game itself, and while those supplements were system neutral, this game would be its own system though they'd use the materials they'd previously published. Crosby decided to use elements of designs he'd first jotted down in the 1970s while he was creating the new game. And once the game came out, the supplements that were released became Harn-specific. The first ever Harn Master Adventure came out in 1988. Okay, I lied. There were actually two of them. A Hundred Bushels of Rye and The Staff of Fanon. 1988 also saw the release of The Pilot's Almanac, which is a very rules-heavy book. And then there were a whole series of magic books and other supplements. Now, as we'll get into in a few minutes, Columbia Games is also a war game company, and they decided to release a war game based on Harn. Harn Battlelust, which dropped in 1992 and was fully compatible with Harn Master. 1996 saw the release of the second edition of Harn Master. 
This second edition was a stripped down version of the first edition. Primarily, the magic systems were stripped out, and those appeared in Harnmaster Magic in 1997 and Harnmaster Religion in 1998. Two more rulebooks came out after that, Harnmaster Manor in 1999 and Harnmaster Barbarians in 2000. Now, we'll discuss Crosby's departure from Columbia in a few minutes, but when Columbia released 2nd Edition, he decided to do his own 2nd Edition, and he called it Harnmaster Gold, and he dropped it in 1998. Harnmaster Gold's rules are much different from the 2nd Edition of Harnmaster, specifically designed to increase the realism of the game. And Harnmaster couldn't escape the D20 craze that overtook the industry following D&D 3rd Edition. Columbia re-released classic setting materials as dual Harn D20 materials. Two of these were Trowbridge Inn, which came out in 2001, and Eval, Kingdom of the Elves, which dropped in 2002. When Crosby got Celestia Productions up and running, the first release was another version of Harnmaster, coming out in 2003 and called Harnmaster Gold Players Edition. It was followed almost immediately by more rulebooks. Columbia wouldn't be deterred, though. The third edition of Harnmaster from them came out in 2003, and it was also more streamlined than their previous releases. Now, supplements are still being released for the game, so check your local game shop or online if you're interested. In addition, the internet provides a number of fan-run sites that produce material for Harnmaster, so you can also get stuff for them as well. Okay, so if you've been confused by the history, you're not alone. But overall, the system's been very successful and has a very loyal fan base out there to this day. And since we covered the setting a bit ago, let's cover the rules here. In Harnmaster, the characters are defined and described primarily by their attributes and skills. As in D&D, attributes generally fall between 3 and 18, with modifiers for race, background, gender, and or medical conditions. What makes Harnmaster different is that it has a way larger number of attributes than other games, and they're a hell of a lot more detailed. So there are the standard qualities you'd come to expect from a tabletop role-playing game. Strength, stamina, intelligence, etc. However, Harnmaster also has attributes for eyesight, hearing, sense of smell, physical attractiveness to the same species. And yeah, I know charisma hints at that in other games, but it's a lot more spelled out with its own attribute here. Dexterity gets split into two attributes, manual and bodily. Willpower and psychic strengths are also attributes. On top of that, there are derived attributes, which are based on combinations of the base attributes. Endurance is one of these, and it's based on strength, stamina, and will. The derived attributes measure and describe a character's basic qualities and abilities. Attributes also help form the basis of the skill system, which makes Harnmaster similar to other fantasy games. Now, insofar as character classes, they don't exist in this game. The character's background is used to figure out the initial skills, and it should be noted that in Harnmaster, backgrounds are very detailed. Now, we've all been told as players to come up with a background for our players, and while some take it seriously, there are always those who don't. That's not an option in Harnmaster, because if you half-ass your background, your character will be half-assed. Characters in the game typically start with multiple sets of skills. Automatic skills. In D&D, these would be the skills that any character can try unskilled. Climbing and jumping would be on that list. Family skills. These are determined by the character's family background. Now, as a part of that background, it's assumed the character worked in whatever profession their parent or guardian worked in until they were about 10 years old. So they would have some basic skills in those occupations. Occupational skills. Now, this may seem redundant, but stay with me here. These skills come from whatever jobs the character has held as an adult. After all, characters aren't always adventuring. I mean, when they're not out saving the world, they've got to do something to make a dollar, right? More specifically, the character could have chosen to not stay in the profession of their parent or guardian. So this would be where they got the skills. Or they might have stayed in that profession. These would be the advanced skills they picked up. Optional militia skills. This would be some basic combat training. These skills specifically apply to characters who don't have a combat-based occupation. So soldiers, bodyguards, and the like would probably not have any of these skills. Another difference in skills is that each one of them can be individually improved. This would be done in play by how the skill is used or through study and training. And yeah, I know that's how it's supposed to work in most other games with skills. The difference is that in Harnmaster, you actually have to do the studying and or training to increase the skill. 
definitely puts Harnmaster more into the R-O-L-E role-playing camp. The advantage to the skill system being the way it is for this game is that anyone can learn pretty much any skill, in theory, anyway. That means your spell slinger could learn some combat feats, and your fighter could learn some of the thieving arts, in theory, anyway. I mean, actual game circumstances and experience would limit how many different skills could be learned, because if there aren't teachers for skills, obviously they can't be learned. And there are a few in-game or in-setting rules that would limit some skills, like the prohibition for non-nobles from owning certain weapons. Skills are rated just a bit differently than attributes are. Skills are rated on a scale of 1 to 95, which means skill resolutions are what the rules define as a D100 roll. Now, while you can find D100s out there, and I've seen them, the easy way to do this would be to bust out your handy-dandy percentile dice and use them. Trust me, D100s are friggin' beasts. Just use the percentile dice. Of course, there can be penalties applied to the skill checks for all of the normal reasons. Fatigue, injury, encumbrance, so on, so forth. These will decrease the target number needed to succeed because skill checks are roll under checks, which means you need to roll the target number or lower to succeed. Successes or failures on rolls that end in five are either critical successes or critical failures. This rule's a bit different from what we've seen in the past. So if the target number is 42 and I roll a 35, I just had a critical success. On the other hand, if I'd rolled a 65, it would be a critical failure. Now this gets really interesting in combat because if the attacker gets a critical success while the defender gets a critical failure, the attacking blow will hit a hell of a lot harder than it might otherwise have. The in-game result could mean the defender was disarmed, knocked prone, knocked off balance, or whatever else the GM might find appropriate. Another major change to the standard game rules does come in combat. Rather than have a pool of hit points or blocks of damage, each injury sustained is tracked individually. That means that a serious injury, such as one resulting from the scenario we laid out a moment ago, could potentially bring about the result of the defender being knocked unconscious, instantly killed, or permanently losing a limb. Those are real options and therefore real stakes for combat. Injuries that go unhealed cause penalties to the character's actions, which means they won't be as effective as they'd otherwise be. In truth, that's way more realistic than the typical fantasy role-playing game. And to keep with the realism, Different types of injuries heal at different rates, and open wounds have the chance to become infected. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, the chance for permanent injuries exists. And since there's not a lot of magic around here, if you lose a limb, it's gone. So this combat system is a definite meat grinder if you decide to have combat in your game. And most of the posts I've read online have strongly suggested, and correctly in my opinion, that combat in Harnmaster should be a last resort only due to the potential for catastrophic changes to the party. Now, I do keep talking about how there's not a lot of magic in Harnmaster. That's true, but there is magic here, so let's take a quick look at it. The entire magic system is based around the six elements. Lyfi, air, light, illusion. Pelion, fire. Jmorvi, metal, artifice. Firvia, life, growth, decay. Odivshi, water, cold. Savoria, mind, spirit, knowledge. And I know I screwed those pronunciations up again, I'm sorry. These six are arranged in a wheel, which means that there are elements opposed to each other. When mages are present in the game, they start out being attuned to one of the elements and are said to be in that elemental convocation. Spells are learned as skills, and obviously spells within your own convocation bring some serious bonuses. That's countered, as you would expect, with serious penalties for spells you learn in the opposing convocation. There are neutral spells out there, and they're neutral because they don't belong to any convocation. As well, there are common spells, which exist in each of the convocations. Oh, and so we're being thorough here, mages are known as Shekvar in Harnmaster. There are also rules for psionics in the game, and they work pretty much the same as the other skills. So we've, we've got a pretty good idea of what the fans think of Harnmaster, since they're still out there playing and supporting the game to this day. But what did the critics think? John Woods reviewed the game for the May 1988 edition of The Games Machine. He said, quote, The layout of the book has a business-like feel that suits the style of the rules well, end quote. He added that, quote, The complex but understandable combat system is the most thorough and realistic fantasy combat system I've ever seen, end quote. His review closed with this, quote, Harnmaster is a system for the purist. 
Whilst the rules are exceedingly clearly written throughout, they will take time and effort to master, and compared to simpler systems will always require more work and thought from players and the GMs alike in play. If you enjoy realism and role-playing, give Harnmaster a try. End quote. Jake Thornton reviewed the game for the March 1989 edition of Games International, and he questioned why the game wasn't as popular or widespread as other games. He gave it a 3.5 out of 5 rating and said this, quote, Harnmaster is not a particularly innovative game, relying in general on tried and trusted ideas. Despite this, the clarity of writing and layout, together with the sheer volume of ready-made background and support material, must make it an attractive alternative for those who like a wealth of detail but haven't got the time themselves. End quote. The second edition of Harnmaster didn't get the same kind of love as the first. Andy Butcher reviewed it for the December 1996 edition of Arcane, and while he did seem to like, quote, the streamlining of the rules with the complexity shunted off into an optional rules section, which makes the game easier to learn and understand, it gives referees the chance to customize the level of detail used in their game, end quote, he didn't like the game overall. He added, quote, it would have been better to drop the psionic rules and campaign background sections and at least present the basics of the magic and religion rules, end quote. He gave second edition a 6 out of 10 and concluded by saying, quote, It's a detailed fantasy system that's logically structured and well designed. Unfortunately, the presentation and high quality of the writing and design don't make up for the lack of rules for magic and religion. If you want to run a historically based low fantasy campaign, though, it could be what you're looking for. End quote. <laughs> now, when I first wrote the outline for today's episode, I'd put something in there about trying to get a copy of this game to my friend Jim because this sounds just like his type of game. Yeah, I should have known. He already has a PDF copy of it. Now I just got to see if he's going to run it sometime. Hmm. Anyway, since we've looked at the setting and the system, why don't we check out the two companies responsible for publishing the game? Since there's some interesting history out there that we just have to check out. Columbia Games was the original publisher of Harnmaster, and they just happened to be one of the oldest manufacturers of board war games that are out there. Tom Dogliesch, Lance Goodridge, and Steve Brewster graduated from Simon and Fraser University in Vancouver, British Columbia in 1971. After graduation, they decided to team up and start a Canadian games company, which they named Gamma 2 Games. As I mentioned, their primary focus was going to be war games, and their first, Quebec 1759, came out in 1972. Steve Brewster left the company shortly after it was formed, and Ron Gibson stepped up to join the company. Gamma 2 dropped two more games, War of 1812 in 1973, and Napoleon, the Waterloo Campaign, 1815 in 1974. However, while sales for Quebec 1759 were over 20,000 copies, the other two games didn't sell that many copies combined. So the three business partners decided to pivot, determining that there just wasn't the market in Canada for board war games. They switched their focus to family-oriented games, with Airline and Klondike in 1975, Super Money, Smoker's Wild, and Foreign Exchange in 1978, Maneuver in 1979, and Score, Soccer Game in 1980. By 1982, the partners decided the company needed a new name and branding, so they changed the name to Columbia Games. In 1983, they got into the tabletop role-playing game market with the aforementioned Harn campaign setting, which, as we mentioned earlier, was designed by N. Robin Crosby. Sometime in the mid-1980s, Gutteridge and Gibson left the company, which left Tom Dagliesch as the sole owner of the company, and he moved the company to Blaine, Washington in 1986. Blaine just happens to be right across the border from Vancouver, and the move was made to make it easier to handle the mail order business they were doing at the time, especially since their major market happened to be the United States. Columbia Games is still based in Blaine, and Dagliesh's son Grant has since come on board as a member of the company. Now, we've mentioned that Columbia has been primarily a war game company, and they've released more than 30 of them over the years. They've also dipped their toes into the collectible card game waters starting in the late 1990s and releasing several games based on their board war games. However, since Harn and Harnmaster are the foci of today's show, I wanted to close our look at Columbia Games with that. Columbia still publishes materials to support Harnmaster to this very day. They call the materials HarnQuest, and they're released as a 32-page product that releases four times a year. For the record, you can subscribe to HarnQuest and get the new materials, including maps, as they are released. 
And in a break from the usual tradition of game companies, all of the product line for Harnmaster that Columbia produces is fully compatible with that produced by Calestia Productions. If you're interested in getting a Harn Quest subscription or picking up any of the Harn materials published by Columbia Games, check out their website at columbiagames.com. That leaves us with one subject left to cover today, and that's Calestia Productions. So, we know that N. Robin Crosby was the creator of Harn and Harnmaster. Since he was producing a ton of product for the setting for Columbia Games, why did he leave to form his own company? Simply put, it was a contract dispute. In 1994, Crosby left the company, but he decided he was going to keep cranking out product for his creation. Columbia continued to maintain their rights to the game, but Crosby never relented. He self-published Harnmaster Gold in 1998. By 2003, he decided he was completely finished with Columbia and terminated the remaining contracts he had with the company. With that move, he made the move to form his own company, Calestia Productions, so that he could keep publishing hard product. While Columbia argued for some time that Crosby didn't have the right to terminate his contract, they were also unable to stop him from producing more product. One of the ways to get around Columbia's arguments was to publish in PDF form only. That way, there wouldn't be issues with game shops getting caught in the middle, and the Harnmaster Gold Player's Edition was the first title released in this form in 2003. Crosby was the one who expanded the releases to look at some of the other islands near Harn, with the Kingdom of Chalimbi in 2005 and Harballer Kingdom of Leidenheim in 2008. His 2005 release, Kethria, was an overview of the entire world of Harn. Sadly, Crosby got sick sometime around 2006 and passed away in 2008. However, the Harn line would continue under the watchful eye of his eldest daughter, Arian. She's continued to push the company and the product along, keeping with her father's vision of expanding the view of the world of Harn, rather than continuing to rehash materials and locations that have already been explored. Over the years, 13 separate releases have given the Harn Master player a wide variety of choices for their campaign and they're still producing new material. If you're interested in checking them out, head over to their website, calestia.com. That's K-E-L-E-S-T-I-A dot com. And with that, we've come to the end of today's tour. So as this podcast releases, I'm getting ready to make the 15-minute drive from my house to head to Collinsville, Illinois, to be a part of Archon 45. We'll have multiple members of the Bad GM Productions family over there over the course of the weekend. And we'll be doing live check-ins on our Facebook page, Twitter, and YouTube throughout the weekend. However, you know this, the best way to see us is to come see us live. So check out the Archon website at archonstl.org for more details. That's A-R-C-H-O-N-S-T-L dot org. And obviously, if you're listening to this on the YouTube channel instead of the live feed, I apologize, but you missed us since YouTube runs a week behind the podcast feed. Sorry about that. We've also got a new episode of Bad GM's Campaign Build Along this week. For those not in the know, that's the show where we build an entire campaign from scratch for you to use for your game group. Normally, I'd have a new build session going this week, but I had to call an audible due to a complete lack of new ideas. So this week, I'm cleaning up some errata from past shows and providing a recap of what my group did during our last session, playing the exact materials we've created on the show. Bad GM's Campaign Build Along is available wherever you get your podcasts or on our website, badgmproductions.net. The music we use for this show comes from pixabay.com. Check them out for all your license-free, royalty-free music needs. Role Playing History is a production of Bad GM Productions. Check us out on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash gaming forward slash Bad GM Prod. Twitter at Bad GMP. YouTube Bad GM Productions. You can email us badgmproductions at gmail.com or you can check us out online, the website badgmproductions.net. Next week, we're going to get into a subject that stirred some controversy amongst the gaming community, and that's the fourth edition of Dungeons and Dragons. Come on now, you knew we had to get to that at some point. Going to try to make it as painless as possible and as informative as I can. But that's next week. Until then, I'm Wayne Davis, and you're role playing history.